Do you have a moment? It's about your mother-in-law. The doctor who had pulled on my arm looked at me with a deeply concerned expression. It's been 10 years since my mother-in-law became wheelchair bound and she has regularly been going to the hospital for checkups and physical therapy. That day, my mother-in-law is at the hospital for the same reason, undergoing tests. I was waiting for my mother-in-law in the waiting room before her therapy session when this doctor grabbed my arm. I'm going to speak with her primary doctor about this. I gently released my arm from the doctor's grip. The doctor standing in front of me was a man, but my mother-in-law's primary was a woman. I hadn't heard of any change in her primary care doctor. I was puzzled as to why a doctor who wasn't her primary would want to talk about my mother-in-law. Seeing the suspicion in my eyes, the male doctor hastily grabbed my hand. There's something neither your mother-in-law nor her primary doctor should hear. That's why I only want to tell you, huh? Only me. I took a step towards the doctor, who was looking at me with a grave expression. My name is Julie. I'm a 37-year-old office worker. I work at a small and medium-sized company, but for some reason I've been working remotely lately. When I was a child, my mother left home, and I was raised in a single-parent family. My father was always... Like your mother was no good woman who ran off with a younger man, he advised me to never meet her. All I heard was that her name was Ion, and she was a spendthrift, treating me like a nuisance and my father like a slave. My parents eventually divorced, and thanks to my father working day and night, I was able to go to college and find a job, albeit not at a big firm. Even though I didn't have a mother, I never felt lonely because of all the love my father gave me. After starting work, I've lived alone and become independent. Fourteen years ago, I married Mike. Mike's father had passed away two years before our wedding, and his mother, who was living alone, warmly welcomed me into their family, treating me like her own daughter. For years into our marriage, my mother-in-law was involved in a car accident and became wheelchair-bound. My mother-in-law used to be a lively and cheerful woman, but since the accident, her smiles have disappeared, and she's become very withdrawn. It must be hard for her to accept limited mobility. Though she had various caregivers over the years, it seemed none of them were a good match, and she seemed to deteriorate. She kept contacting us, saying she felt lonely and wanted us to come back, even if it was for a short while. Concerned, we decided to move back into his family home to take care of her. We decided to take a week off using our paid time off to dedicate to her care and then return to our jobs once she was feeling better. My mother-in-law seemed relieved when my husband and I came to visit. After a few days, she began to smile again. But when we told her that we needed to get back to work, her demeanor changed completely. She didn't let us go. She was like, no, please, both of you don't leave, don't leave me alone, crying out nearly hysterical. Trying to calm her, I was like, look, Mike really needs to get back to his job, but I'll talk to my company and see if I can stay here a bit longer. I'll come back as often as I can. Just hang in there for me, July. If you can stay, that would be great. Mike, you better come back, okay? I'll be waiting. After the loss of her husband, my mother-in-law had been alone for a long time. When we, as a couple, came to visit, she was overjoyed, but our sudden notification of leaving her likely brought on feelings of anxiety and confusion. I guessed her weakened state over the past week made her more fearful of facing her loneliness. After discussing with my company, I decided to switch to remote work and work for a short time from home until my mother-in-law calmed down. While taking care of her, ever since then, she despised being alone. Even when I worked from home, she'd always be clinging to me. No matter how close we might be, I couldn't let her be seen by my coworkers. Even if I asked her to leave the room, she'd always be waiting somewhere she could see me. It felt like I was being watched, and I began to resent it. Mike, on the other hand, would come home on weekends and even take some days off during the week to help with her care. Although she continued physical therapy, there was no improvement in her condition, which meant I couldn't return to the office. Our personal lives were dominated by her care, leaving no time for just the two of us. This year marks the 10th year of this lifestyle. She turned 65. With each passing year, her dependence on us grew. 
My husband, unable to bear it, reduced his visits year by year. Even if I stepped out for just a few minutes, my mother-in-law would freak out, yelling, and she was like, take me with you. Calming her down took ages, and I couldn't go back to our own home, but I couldn't abandon the woman who had welcomed me from a single-parent household without any judgment or prejudice. Then one day, everything changed. On this day, my mother-in-law had a routine checkup, as always. I accompanied her to the hospital. My mother-in-law's doctor was a woman in her 30s named Mia. She had been taking care of my mother-in-law for 10 years, and I trusted her completely. After my mother-in-law went into the examination room, I stepped outside to take a work call. When I returned about 15 minutes later, a young male doctor stopped me. Excuse me, you're Sally's daughter, right? Sally is my mother-in-law's first name. The doctor who called out using my mother-in-law's name was a male doctor, a bit younger than me. It was Ryan, and he recently transferred to this hospital. He mentioned that he's worked in the same department as Dr. Mia, who has been in charge of my mother-in-law. Taken aback, I was like, yes, actually, I'm her daughter-in-law. But what's going on? Well, I'm sorry for the sudden approach. Do you have a moment? I need to discuss something about your mother-in-law, said Dr. Ryan. Sure, what's up? I figured my mother-in-law's appointment probably wasn't over yet, so I agreed. Then Dr. Ryan looked a bit relieved and led me to a small private room. It was a consultation room not too far from the examination rooms. Dr. Ryan motioned for me to sit in a chair on the side, and once I settled in, he took a seat across a small desk looking directly into my eyes. You're currently living with Sally at her house to take care of her, right? He asked. Oh, yes, that's right. I explained that for the past ten years I've been working from my mother-in-law's home while caring for her. I hardly had time to hang out with friends, let alone have some alone time with my husband because of my mother-in-law's increased dependency. My husband started avoiding coming home. I lost almost all of my personal time, so I couldn't really discuss the care of my mother-in-law with anyone else. Dr. Ryan nodded, listening intently, which made me spill all the frustrations I'd been feeling. Oh, I'm so sorry for going on and on like this, I said. It's completely all right anyway. Wow, ten years, he said with a gentle smile, and then his face grew thoughtful. Moments later, Dr. Ryan looked at me with a serious expression. He started talking. However, what reached my ears wasn't Dr. Ryan's words, but a scream from my mother-in-law in a panic. Both Dr. Ryan and I rushed to the examination room where my mother-in-law was, and what we saw was unthinkable. I was at a loss for words. Dr. Ryan shook his head, and he was like, You should leave that house ASAP. Get away from your mother-in-law. His words left me speechless. Suppressing the anger that welled up inside me, I nodded to Dr. Ryan. I didn't go to my mother-in-law, but headed straight to the police. Though skeptical they'd listen— they promised to send someone to investigate, so I hurriedly packed up my things from the house. The image of what I'd seen at the hospital kept replaying in my mind. An hour or so later, as I was still packing, I called my husband to explain everything. Throughout, I kept receiving countless calls and messages from my mother-in-law. She must have been worried since I didn't show up even after her treatments but I continued to ignore her non-stop calls and messages until I mostly finished packing. In the evening, my husband and the police arrived, and that's when I finally answered a call from my mother-in-law. Julie, where are you? I've called so many times. Why aren't you picking up? As soon as the call connected, my mother-in-law yelled with fury. Normally, I'd apologize immediately, but this time, with a firm attitude, I was like, I'm at home. Why did you leave me behind and go home first? How could you do that? My mother-in-law continued to rant and rave. Sighing, I was like, Hey, I realized I don't need to live with you anymore, so I'm going back to the house where my husband is, I told my mother-in-law firmly. Well, Julie, what on earth are you thinking? But it turned out even that wasn't necessary. While I was speaking with Dr. Ryan, I heard a woman scream from the examination room. Was that my mother-in-law? Dr. Ryan and I exchanged glances and quickly went to check the room. The exam room door had a window, and through it we saw my mother-in-law making gestures as if swatting away an insect. Indeed, the scream had been my mother-in-law's. But why would there be a bug in the exam room? As it turned out, my mother-in-law had mistaken dust for a bug. 
We saw her picking up the motionless dust and walking over to the trash can to throw it away. Incredibly, my mother-in-law walked without the need for a wheelchair or cane, moving with light steps. I stared in shock as Dr. Ryan pushed me to the corner of the hallway. Peeking into the examination room, we noticed that my mother-in-law didn't seem to be aware of us. She calmly returned to her wheelchair as if nothing had happened. Just then, Dr. Mia came back into the room and slowly extended her hand to my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law, seemingly in response, placed a brown envelope in her hand. Dr. Mia discreetly slipped the envelope into her skirt pocket and, acting as if nothing unusual had transpired, pushed my mother-in-law's wheelchair towards the facility for physical therapy. Julie, are you okay? I was so stunned by the series of events that I could only stand frozen until Dr. Ryan spoke softly to me. It wasn't that she couldn't walk or even that she believed she couldn't. She was pretending to be immobile. Trembling, I felt Dr. Ryan's hand on my shoulder, shaking his head gently. He advised me to leave my mother-in-law's house immediately, and I quickly packed to escape from my mother-in-law. Throughout my story, my mother-in-law remained silent. Finally, with a sigh audible over the phone, she began to speak, perhaps realizing she couldn't evade the truth any longer. It's true that I became wheelchair-bound after a car accident, and it's true I was injured seriously enough to need care. But thanks to the treatments, about five years after the accident, I could walk with the aid of a cane, she confessed. My husband and I, listening over the speaker, were stunned to think she had recovered in just five years. What then was the purpose of the twelve years we had spent caring for her? I feared that once you both found out I could walk, you'd leave my mother continued. My sigh, Julie Mike, I couldn't bear that thought. We knew she loved us dearly from her day-to-day -day attitude. She had us take care of her to ensure we wouldn't leave, Julie said. I truly love you like my own daughter. After Mike moved out and my husband passed away, I felt so lonely, my mother-in-law repeatedly told us. But our hearts remained unmoved. We knew that, Mom, Mike, but the way you went about it was wrong. We can't be by your side any longer, sorry. Look, I've been taking care of you for the past ten years while working. My colleagues have experienced promotions, marriages, and childbirth due to your care. I couldn't have a child of my own. I had almost given up on having kids. But now I feel like the past ten years are in vain. Why did you deceive us to the point of having us care for you? We would have visited you during our time off. Why did it have to be this way? I didn't mean to blame her, but as the words poured out, so did my tears. With my husband supporting me, I told my mother-in-law that I didn't intend to care for her anymore. We would leave her house today and never contact her again. My mother-in-law protested and grew hysterical, but we hung up. The police, after understanding the details, said they'd begin an investigation. Two months later, after moving, I was at a hospital with my husband. When we were about to leave after finishing our doctor's appointment, a familiar person rushed over to us. It was Dr. Mia, who was supposed to be my mother-in-law's doctor. We remembered her with fuller cheeks, but she looked gaunt, and fatigue emanated from her entire being. Wondering why she was at this hospital, we couldn't decline her as she approached with a desperate look, so we reluctantly listened to what she had to say. Turns out Dr. Mia knew all along that my mother-in-law's leg was healed, and she had accepted money from her to give her a disability diagnosis. She mentioned that the money was also in the envelope she received from my mother-in-law that day. Apparently, due to a complaint by Dr. Ryan recently, the hospital found out, and she was fired immediately. Furthermore, since she had continuously forged medical certificates, she's likely going to be arrested for fabricating medical records and it's almost certain that her medical license will be revoked. But she insisted that she didn't do anything wrong. Incredibly, Dr. Mia claimed that the money wasn't an appreciation gift for my mother-in-law, but hush money for my husband and me. She alleged we plotted to scam disability pension by making my mother-in-law disabled, and she had written the necessary documents reluctantly after we threatened her and paid her off. But there was no evidence of any of this. It was Dr. Mia who extended her hand to my mother-in-law that day. 
I couldn't believe that she put all the blame on us just because she was in trouble, about to be arrested. What are you talking about? We haven't done anything like that, I exclaimed. No, that's the truth. I'm going to tell the police everything. Dr. Mia, her eyes red with rage, shouted, making us turn pale. While her claims had no evidence, it would also be tough for us to prove we had nothing to do with her. Terrified at the thought of being demanded to prove our innocence a devil's proof, my husband and I were on the verge of tears when a woman approached us. She stood between Dr. Mia and us, shielding us. Um, aren't you the head doctor here? I urgently need to talk to you, she said. Upon seeing the woman, Dr. Mia turned deathly pale. She quickly put on a forced smile and approached, buttering up the woman who was glaring at her. Do you need something for my daughter? The woman glaring at Dr. Mia was the head doctor of this hospital, and she was I, my mother. Yes, my mother, whom I was separated from as a child due to her divorce, was a doctor. After divorcing my father, she quickly rose through the ranks and has been the head of a major university hospital. She was also one of the people who agreed with revoking Dr. Mia's medical license when she found out about her misdeeds. Oh, you're related. In that case, could you please just hear me out? I was only threatened by them and wrote the diagnosis reluctantly as a mother. You wouldn't want your daughter to be a criminal, right? Can't you help me out? Dr. Mia begged, trying to invoke my mother's sympathy right then and there, but my mother shook her head. Don't mess with me. You and Sally have been deceiving the hospital and the authorities for ten years, keeping my daughters confined at home. Sally kept them at home because she was afraid to be alone. You, on the other hand, funded your debts from your nightlife with Sally's disability benefits. You frauds need to face appropriate punishment and make amends, she said. Dr. Mia's plea was abruptly dismissed. No way, absolutely not, my mother declared. Realizing there was nothing she could do, Dr. Mia slumped to the ground in despair. Whispers and stares from those around us focused on her and we couldn't help but watch with indescribable feelings. Suddenly a strong pull came from behind. I was startled and turned around to find, astonishingly, my mother-in-law standing firmly beside my father. You! What have you done to Julie? My father shouted angrily at my mother. Dad, why are you here and why with my mother-in-law? I asked, puzzled. When I heard that Sally was looking for Julie, I wanted to help. You moved to a place without telling me. I thought I would meet you if I followed, Dr. Mia explained. The reason I hadn't told my father our whereabouts was not just because of the family connection between my mother-in-law and him. Ever since my mother-in-law had a car accident, I had asked my father to look after her when I was out for work. It was during those times that they became close and started dating secretly behind the backs of both of us. I had found out about this last year when I happened to see my father and my mother-in-law talking closely at my in-law's house on a few occasions. After returning from an outing, I suspected their relationship and hence didn't go to my father when we moved. The very sight of them together now sent shivers down my spine. Give Julie back. I won't let you take her away. Julie, Mike, let's go home. My father, yelling at my mother, had an intensity I'd never seen before. Brushing off my father's grip, I shouted, Stop it! I know all the stories you told me about mom are lies. My father's face went pale at my shout. Turned out since the divorce, he had been feeding me lies about my mother to make sure I didn't want to meet her. The stories about her treating him like a slave or leaving him for a younger man were all false. My mother, an accomplished doctor, always had a busy schedule. My father knew this when they married, but after I started daycare, his attitude shifted drastically. He blamed her for our lack of family vacations and decided to divorce her, claiming she wasn't a good mother. My father suddenly took me and left home on my fourth birthday. In reality, it was my father who left, not my mother. Following the divorce settlement, even though my mother had a decent income, she couldn't guarantee time for raising me, so my father was nominated to live with me. However, my mother had been sending a substantial amount in child support every month. I didn't know until I met my mother. Even after becoming a single parent, my father made sure I didn't want to see my mother by portraying her in a negative light with false stories. It seemed that my mother wanted to see me, 
but most of the time she was overseas for trainings or researches. Even she kept sending me letters from overseas, but my father kept refusing, hiding the letters. There were times when it seemed they might meet, but something always came up. Either my mother got an emergency call at the hospital or my father would come up with an excuse to cancel at the last minute. I'd been told since I was young that my mother couldn't be reached or that no one knew where she was. Turned out that was a lie. The reason my father could afford to travel once every two months and pay for my high school and college tuition was thanks to the child support money from my mother. Our comfortable life was all thanks to my mother, so the story of my father working late nights was also a sham to make it seem like he was struggling with parenting. He'd work a regular nine-to-five job, then spend the night somewhere, coming home only in the early morning. When my father yelled, where's your proof? My mother confidently showed him a mobile bank app. She said, this is how much I've transferred to you over the years for Julie and your company. Unusually, the company has strict policies against second jobs, so it was impossible. I can confirm with them if you'd like. I recounted my father crumbled, and my mother-in-law tried to comfort him. Seeing my father like this made me realize that I had been lied to my entire life. While the truth was shocking, I felt more anger than anything else. Thanks for everything, Dad, but it's time to say goodbye, I said coldly. My father clung to me, and my mother-in-law interjected, Julie, your dad did everything he thought was best for you. No, he did it for himself. He lied about struggling as a single parent, using the money from my mom, and you lied to my husband and me, trying to bind us to your home. Both of you are a perfect match for your lies. Please stay away from us, I declared, with no excuses left. My father and my mother-in-law were speechless. Ignoring their stunned faces, we left the hospital with my mother. Later, Dr. Mia was arrested and lost her medical license. She had forged medical documents multiple times and was sentenced to imprisonment. Additionally, the hospital she worked for is suing her for defamation. My mother-in-law had bribed a doctor for a fake diagnosis, leading to her having to pay back all the pension money she received with interest. She's also facing fraud charges, as informed by the police. Mike says he's cut ties with her, so he's not bothered about her future. I'm trying not to care either. As for me, I realized I had been somewhat dependent on my mother-in-law. Feeling betrayed sent me into a mental spiral. So I've been seeing a therapist at the hospital where my mother works. Regarding my reunion with my mother, when I was getting a referral at my previous hospital, the doctor's name I was referred to was the same as my mother's. To my surprise, it was actually her. My mother was skeptical when she saw a patient named me, but during the consultation, she realized it was me. Our reunion can only be described as miraculous. I can't be treated by my mother due to hospital rules, but she supports me from behind the scenes. I've been back to my job at the office while still attending therapy. When visiting Dr. Ryan, who informed me of the truth about my mother-in-law, I heard that he and my husband were old high school buddies. We now often hang out with Ryan, visiting our place, and everything feels like old times. It may be hard for me to forget how I was tied up by my mother-in-law and my father, but my husband, my mother, and Dr. Ryan always encouraged me to take things easy and do what I want. Thanks to that, I'm planning trips with my friends or going to cafes by myself.